my favorite sponsor and your favorite sponsor, apparently, because you guys have been going to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and using code BUCK for 20% off your order quite a bit. I've become their best advertiser and I'm happy to do that for them because I love them as people. They're a wonderful family. They support this show and I love their products. They've got all kinds of things, including some new ones because of this new farm bill that's been passed. They've got, of course, regular full spectrum unflavored CBD tinctures. They've got these new THC V gummies. They've got the massage oil you know about. They've got the sleeping bundle if you guys need some help sleeping. If you're sore, they have these CBD bath bombs. But me personally, I have to go for the cool menthol sports cream if you guys lift and work out. It's the most effective sports cream I've ever used. They've got things for your pets, the CBD dog chews, pet tinctures. They've got so much CBD salve. A lot of the stuff now has this THCV in it, and it's a minor cannabinoid found in the cannabis sativa strain. It's isolated from the hemp plant for their line. A lot of people call it diet weed. Anyway, go check it out. They're wonderful people. These products are really good. They work, I promise you that. I use the products that I advertise. Let's put it that way. And again, it's at palomaverdecbd.com. Enter promo code BUCK at checkout. It gets you 20% off of your order. Let's get to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, cause I call the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of law. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. I hope you guys had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Great to have you with me here this week. The last one of the year. The last episode of the year. And it's a very good one. I know you guys love when Dr. Mark McDonald is on this show. I always get a lot of feedback from his appearances. He doesn't shy away from the spicy topics, we will say. So those of you who are new to the show, and I know there are some out there, Dr. Mark McDonald is an author. He's the author of Freedom from Fear and the United States of Fear. And we've had him on discussing these topics before. He's also the main guy at one of my favorite substacks, the Dissident MD substack. And his articles that he writes there. I highly recommend it. Go to that Substack and subscribe to it. We are talking about two of them today and they kind of intertwine. So the first one's called The Disappearance of the American Man. The second one is called Why American Women Are Undateable. And like I said, these are there's a lot of overlap in these two pieces that he wrote. And we're getting into all of these things today. And at the end, we're talking about a lot of people have depression issues around the holidays and specifically in December. So we talk about why that might be. And Dr. McDonald gives some advice on how to get out of that, climb out of that dark winter depression. And so if any of you guys have that, stay tuned, of course, to the end. And maybe this episode will bring you out of that sadness because it's a very good one. Before we get going, I got to tell you guys about that exclusive club I've mentioned a few times and it's working. More of y'all are joining this exclusive club It's $5 per month or more at patreon.com slash counterflow. And you will then be invited to the once a month Q&A sessions on Zoom with me and sometimes with a guest. And we'll just chat and talk about whatever y'all would like to talk about. Again, these will be private with just these people in this exclusive club invited. It will not be on YouTube. It will not be broadcast or sent out as a podcast on the weekly feed. None of that. It's all private, all exclusive. And speaking of, it won't be on YouTube. With this show dropping, my ban should be up. So this should be on YouTube. My show from last week that I was not allowed to have up on YouTube with Mark Clare, that'll be put on YouTube. And speaking of that, since we had this little ban going on, I do have a Rumble channel now. So if you do Rumble, if you like Rumble more than YouTube, go there and subscribe to our channel, Counterflow with Buck Johnson. So back to this awesome guest, Dr. Mark McDonald. Welcome back to the show, sir. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too. Yeah. As we record this, uh, it's just a few days away. So I, I love this time of the year. And we're going to also, I do want to get into 
at some point here with you. Not everyone does. And I, that's, uh, it's a topic that, that should be discussed more often. So we'll get into that as well. But my audience, I know this for a fact, they're always glad to see you on this show. But for the new folks I have, uh, give them a quick rundown of, of who Dr. Mark McDonald is, and then we'll jump into things. Well, the basics are pretty straightforward. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist in private practice here in Los Angeles. I see kids. I also see adults. I see couples, families. I do medication management, therapy, combination of both. But what I really am more in the public sphere is a writer and a speaker ever since April, May of 2020 on top. That I consider as a title of the podcast that I co-host with Dr. Jeff Barkey, Informed Dissent, the Intersection of Medicine and Politics. And I write about that in my Substack as well, Dissident MD. And I published a couple of books on that topic. First, The United States of Fear, which came out in November of 2021. And then more recently, Freedom from Fear, which came out in the summer of 2022. And both books are really about, from a macro level, and then really on micro level, the second book, what happened to us in 2020? Why did things just suddenly go off the cliff or at least apparently suddenly go off the cliff? And, and what can we do about it? How can we bring ourselves back to a healthy, when I say healthy, I mean emotionally, politically, financially, socially healthy life as an individual, as a family and as a country? And anything that intersects with that or that connects up with that is a topic that I enjoy speaking about and writing about. And that, to me, is really more of who I am now than just a prescriber for mental illness for children. Sure. You, you mentioned your substack there, and, and I highly recommend it to, to those folks listening. In fact, that's kind of what spurred on this interview is uh, a few pieces, one being the disappearance of the American man. And we got, we've got to talk about that. And I was telling you uh, before we started rolling here, I had this entire outline ready, all these questions ready to go. And then lo and behold, you pump out another amazing substack this morning called Why American Women Are Undateable. Uh, I think these topics are intertwined, so we can kind of do that as, as we go here. But something that popped out in the piece, The Disappearance of the American Man, you used the term, uh, where is it, cultural genocide that's been going on. That's a. Uh, that's some strong terminology. And so let's get into that. I think a lot of it, we've seen it, certainly, in my opinion, over the last couple of years, like you alluded to, 2020, 2021, and so on. We kind of saw a lot of this uh, metastasize, if you will, because it does seem to be something like that. But let, why did you use that term, cultural, cultural genocide? Let's get into that. Well, I think we've been distracted for a long time by medical conflicts and medical panics from real underlying problems in our country that have been existing and have pre-existed really the panic of 2020, which is still ongoing to a large degree, at least the reverberations of it are. And I think that we really do ourselves a disservice in not noting the roots of a problem that were not really medical to begin with. The roots were cultural. And one of the roots of the problems that we're still grappling with is a long-standing, concerted, conscious, organized effort to undermine masculinity in this country. Buck Johnson, I have Buck Johnson, you're Buck Johnson. Look, Jack Donovan <laughs> is an author that I've been following recently, and he's written a lot, and not recently, I mean, he, he wrote it 10 or 15 years ago, about this crisis. And one of the books that I've read that I, I highly recommend anyone who wants to try to understand better what's happening to the masculine in this country is the way of men. And in this book, which is a, a really amazing thesis on the genocide of masculinity, as you describe it, and as I use those words, there are four qualities that make up a man, a masculine man, not a good man, but a masculine man. A masculine man is not a moral man. A masculine is amoral. He's just masculine. To be a good man, you need to add in other layers like virtue and, uh, and goodness. But the masculine man is comprised of four qualities. First is physical strength. The second is courage. The third is mastery. And the fourth is honor. Those four qualities can be used for good or bad. They could be used to save a life. They could be used to end a life. The godfather is a masculine man, but he's not a good man. 
mobsters are not good men, but they're masculine men. And that's why they're very attractive to men and to women. Women are attracted to masculine men. They're attracted to bikers as much as they're attracted to soldiers and warriors. And they're not always the same in terms of virtues and good qualities. And I think there's been a lot of confusion, intentional confusion recently between good men and men who are masculine men. And I think the emphasis has unfortunately shifted towards being a good man in the absence of being a masculine man. And that is a big problem. That's like saying, I want to be a strawberry cake, but I don't know how to be a cake. Mm. Well, how can you be a flavored cake if you don't even know what a cake is? Or if you, you're trying to be a Danish, but you want to be a strawberry Danish, and yet underlying goal is to be a cake. Well, you're never going to get there because you're confused about who you are at the core. You're confused about the essence of who you are. And I think the reason for this, the intention behind it, is to end those four traits of masculinity and to allow our country to become hyper-feminized, focusing on what is the good, the virtue, which is always changing. It's culturally dependent on who you are in a, in, in a, in a specific place, in a specific time, a specific people. Whereas those four traits of masculinity are universal, meaning that across time and across cultures, they are always the same. There is not one time or place in history, human history, where a physically weak man has been considered to be masculine. Never. And yet, what is good can be determined by a political consensus. So today, for example, what is good is for a boy to wear a skirt and to put on makeup and to prance around in high heels. That's a good boy. Is that a masculine boy? Absolutely not. But we've been redefined. Our cultural norms, as I said in my recent book, Freedom from Fear, our cultural and social norms have been redefined, not by the most courageous among us, but by the most fearful. And so if you can inject fear into a society, which is what happened in 2020, and I would still say that we're, we're rather fearful today, then you can control the good, you can control the cultural norms and values, redefine them to suit your purposes, whether you're a politician, a corporation, or a media outlet, and then wipe away the actual true foundation of society, the, the, the part that you push off of the floor, so to speak, which in my view, for half of the, the population, the men, is the masculine. And in place of that, there's now a vacuum. And that vacuum is being filled by women, understandably, because women fill the vacuums that men leave behind. And it's not a good sign. And it's not a good outcome because the vacuum is being filled by harpies, by Karens, by those who are not rational. And there's now a movement, a counter movement by a minority of women to push back against that and to fill that space, to retake it, to reclaim it. But it's not women's role to battle. That's not what they're meant to do. They're doing it because it's a time of war. We have women taking over the factories and building bullets in World War II because the men are off to fight. But in peacetime, women are not building bullets. They're there raising the families. They're there in the homes. So I think this is so important. It's such an important issue. It's not just a political issue. It's not just a social issue. This gets to the essence of who we are as a people, not, not just as Americans, but as humans. And if we don't reclaim masculinity and stop this genocide of men, then we are we are literally doomed. We cannot reproduce. We cannot survive. We cannot thrive. Masculinity is under attack, not just culturally, but also physically. You look at the rates and the, the incidence of the lowering of testosterone, mm -hmm. of reproduction, of marriage, of families, of people going to church, of civic organizations. I think a lot of it stems from the disappearance of the man. And it's not just that the men have walked away. The men have actually been attacked. They've been grounded from flying. They've been turned into feminized little boys and we're building a generation of girls who are, should be men. And I think it's a tragedy. That's why I speak about this. I think it's so important. Yeah. And it, it seems to drive this type of apathy on, on the male side, at least. And then, uh, and then that leads to issues down the road with the feminine side. And uh, for instance, I, I've spoken with two single females that I know in the past few months, friends of mine, and they've both told me, well, I, the last guy I dated sat and played video games all of the time. And then when he wasn't on playing video games, even when I was with him, um, he was on Instagram looking at reels all day long. And it's, and then that drives, I mean, that's pathetic, obviously. And so the man sitting there doing that, and then it drives this kind of miserable attitude uh, that the, and that develops within the woman, 
which I think, and we can get into this, leads to your piece, Why American Women Are Undateable, because this kind of steamrolls forward and it's all unhealthy and it's it's bizarre and kind of sad. And like you said, it seems like if we don't fix it, we're doomed. And now we're doomed on so many levels, financially, um, the lack of religion, the lack of social cohesion. And this kind of undergirds a lot of that is these issues between women and men. Um, speak to, I, I assume you see uh, patients that that complain of the things I just complained of with, with women complaining, well, my guy just sits there on Instagram or, or plays video games. Do you see that often? I would say this is actually the real pandemic. In my practice, I don't see people falling over dead from respiratory infections, but I see them dead in spirit in their homes alone, unwilling and unable to find a companion. And that's a different type of death. And I think it's a lot more profoundly affecting to me as a clinician because there's nothing that I can do about it immediately. It's a societal problem. It's not something that I can give antibiotics for or uh, increase exercise and weight loss and go to your primary care doctor for. It doesn't work like that. These young men, as I wrote about in my, my recent substack that she cited, uh, Why American Women Are Undateable, a recent patient of mine in his 20s uh, has been saying to me uh, quite Quite powerfully, I want to give up. I'm done with the dating. I am feeling as if just going out and meeting a girl is a chore. And I, I ask him, why does he feel that way? Why is dating not a thrill? Why is it a chore? Why is not meeting uh, a woman that you can potentially develop a life with, have a family with? Why is that not exciting? Why is that not the highlight of your day? Yeah. And largely, largely the problem is that. The girls that he meets are not encouraging him and supporting him in his masculinity. So he is chipping away at it, trying to figure out some method to please the woman that unfortunately goes directly against his desires and his natural inclination to grow as a man. This is why the men are staying home and why they're playing video games, why they are not out and about talking to girls, expressing their desires, telling women that they're attractive, saying, I want you, I want you in my life. And they're not doing that because when they go out on dates and they speak to women, the women give them the impression through their body language or through their words that they don't want the man to express desire. They don't want the man to express strength. They don't want the man to express courage. They don't want the man that they're with to be a masculine man with them. They give the impression to the man that if he expresses these traits, if he expresses assertiveness, leadership, strength, courage, mastery, or honor, that she will judge him and criticize him for being fill in the blank in an istic or an ism. He is misogynistic. He is paternalistic. He is a potential rapist. He is a right-wing, Trump-supporting, white, uh, homophobic racist. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever the word is, it's going to be something slanderous so that he's then encouraged to play this game of what can I say and do that will be the opposite of what will get me in trouble with those types of words and language and phrases. And so he becomes passive. He uh, indicates that, you know, she can pay for the dinner because she's an independent woman. He lets her lead in what to order and how to go through the door and what to do next on the date. He doesn't speak up and talk about his accomplishments because he doesn't want to make her feel bad because she's an upstanding career woman and she's making money and she's going to be partner in the firm. So he should take a back seat to her and let her lead. He indicates to her that if only women ran the world, things would be a better place because that's, of course, the truth, right? That's what we're told. The problems that we have in society are because of these, these violent, angry men who are fighting all the time, starting wars. If only women were to lead, everything would be peaceful and maternal. So he wants to support that. So he's, he's going to support the woman. You know, here, here's the woman. She's going to roar. Well, the problem with this, other than the fact that it's all a lie, is that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually make women excited to be around men either. 
Because I hear the same stories from the women when they come back and they say, I just can't seem to find any men that make me excited and feel safe and contain me and make me feel like this, you know, this little girl being held in the arms of a strong man. I need that. They say that to me. But then when they go out on their date, they do just the opposite. They encourage the opposite. So there's this ping pong effect. It's like a vicious circle. So mm-hmm. I know a lot of people will blame me or, or, or attack me for writing this piece about the undateable American woman and say, I'm attacking women. Well, look back at what I've written before about attacking, so-called attacking it's the American man. They're both mm-hmm. to blame. But it's so easy to criticize the American man. He's such an easy target. If you criticize a man, just like if you criticize a white heterosexual Christian, everybody cheers you on. Mm-hmm. If you say one well-founded negative or critical word to someone who's a Muslim or non-white or a yeah. woman or gay or trans or whatever it is you want to call it, immediately you are derided, you're attacked, you're pillory. So I know that this is going to be a lightning rod for a lot of people. Uh, to state that American women are undateable, but it's true. Mm-hmm. They are undateable and they're undateable for a lot of reasons. And it's not just because of the women, it's not just their own fault. It's also men's fault. But I want to focus on holding women accountable for this problem. Because if they don't wake up and realize that they need to be women too, just like men need to be men, men need to be men, then we're going to wind up with this ongoing separation of the sexes with men retreating further and further, playing video games, staying at home, becoming basically little mama's boys in their parents' garages and women growing older and Mm -hmm. growing alone Mm -hmm. and feeling despondent and angry and bitter. And we don't need angry, bitter, despondent women, just like we don't need um, weak, uh, passive and uh, hyper emotionally overly reactive men either. We need men and we need women and men need men and women need women. And we we have to get back to that truth and stop uh, using women and stop using men as these um, kind of whipping boys for uh, cultural and political causes. It's BS, it needs to stop. My good friend, Mark Clare, formerly of Lions of Liberty, you know him, you love that voice, you love his interview style because, well, he's damn good at it. He's got a new show we gotta tell you about. It is called none other than The Mark Clare Show. And I've listened to every episode of it so far and I love it. It's very good. Mark's interview style is spectacular. Let's put it that way. But I like it because this new show goes much further than just discussing politics like he used to do. He's trying to go further, like I said, maybe getting into spirituality, religion, entrepreneurship, things that will help you guys better understand and navigate this crazy world. He does some conspiracy stuff on there, which I really like. He wants to help you guys diffuse propaganda. Now that in itself is a very tough task, but he can do it because he's got guests like Sam Tripoli. I just listened to that episode today. Absolutely loved it. He's got guests like friend of this show, Charlie Robinson. He's got guests like another amazing friend of this show, Father Turbo Qualls. And when Father Turbo's on a show, it's a must listen. You just know it is. So find the Mark Claire show on Rockfin, Patreon. He's got a Telegram channel. He's got all of it. He's got a YouTube channel. And of course, it's on every podcatcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anything that you're listening to this show on. If you type in The Mark Clare Show, you can listen to this excellent new show. And I highly recommend that you do. I do. I love it. And a quick heads up, the spelling of Mark Clare's name is Mark with a C and Clare without an E. M-A-R-C-C-L-A-I-R. The Mark Clare Show. Go find it. Yeah, the irony, I suppose, of some women getting upset with your article or, or this, this podcast, if they see it, the ones that are going to be upset are probably going to react in a manner that you're describing in the piece. Um, brutal. Painful. They will. Yeah. They will. They'll become dysregulated emotionally, angry, mean, unfriendly, or in the words that Jack Donovan, I, I love his work because it's just so on point, even though it's controversial. They will take away from the three qualities that men need for a woman to be attractive. And they're simple. They're not that difficult. Being pretty, being charming, and being carefree. And everything I just described is the antithesis of that. Women who don't do their makeup, don't wear nice, attractive feminine clothes, sweats in a scrunchie, baggy jeans, baggy pants, mousy hair, physically unattractive, not charming, argumentative, cynical, accusatory, demanding, competitive, and not carefree, constantly foisting their emotional problems and their dysregulation on the man saying, 
I'm a woman. I can be as emotional as I want to be. It's your job to just suck it up like a sponge. Just like I have bad breath and I stink because I haven't showered for three days. Well, you know what? I'm just being me. You just, you just take it. Mm. But we don't do that to people. We don't, we don't impose our bad breath and our body odor on other people because we're just being natural. Well, it's just natural as well for a lot of women to be emotionally unhinged at times. Should we tolerate that? No. Should women allow themselves to express that? Well, I have PMS, so I can just be a B. No, you can't. You need to contain that just like men need to contain their aggression and their sexual drives. That's, that's men's burden. Well, women have a burden too, and it's to contain their emotions. Now, men can help them with that, but it's not a man's job to clean up the sloppy mess left behind of a dysregulated emotional woman. Not at all. What do you mean by that? That's a term I've heard more, uh, more often recently than I used to is the dysregulated uh, emotions. I've, I've heard that term, and, and maybe it's a medical you know, specific term, but what does that mean, dysregulated emotions in a woman? Well, everyone has feelings. Everyone has emotions. There's no good emotions. There's no bad emotions. We feel them all the time. However, we should not allow our emotions to dictate our decisions, nor our actions. This is an important thesis that runs through everything that I write, everything that I say. One of the biggest problems that we've had in the last few years as a society has been that we have been making decisions and acting on them through pure emotion, not through reason, not through critical thinking. And when someone is emotionally dysregulated, what I mean by that is that the natural state of emotions, whether it's high or low or, or, or somewhere in between, can be anything, all people have ups and downs of emotional states, strong emotions, weak emotions. Sometimes we don't really feel anything. It's sometimes, and then we'll get back on the, on the emotional roller coaster again. Those will exist regardless of what we do. We're just human. But when they're dysregulated, we are now allowing those feelings to direct our choices, our actions and our behaviors. So a dysregulated woman will not only feel things strongly, she will also use words and take actions to further those feelings, to express them, and often not in good ways. So for example, if a man looks up at the waitress and smiles and she happens to be very attractive, and the woman looks at him and she feels this twins of jealousy, okay, fine, normal, feeling jealous, everybody has that feeling. Rather than taking a breath, calming down and thinking and saying, he appreciates and admires female beauty. That's why, that's why he's with me. That's why he's not, that's why he didn't get up and walk out with, with the waitress right now. He appreciates her, but he chose me. I'm so glad that he, he appreciates female beauty in all of its forms and still chooses to stay with me. What an honorable man and feels even better. Instead of that, she looks over at him and she says, Oh, so you're going to disrespect me. By looking at that waitress, is that it? So you're going to disrespect me? You just don't even care about me. Well, you know what? F you, I'm going to get up and walk on him so you learn how to behave, man. And she stalks out of the restaurant, gets in the car, starts crying. What does he do? Well, he gets up, he follows after. He says, I'm so sorry. I'll never look at another woman again. You're the only one in my life. I don't think about anyone from the moment I rise to the moment I rest. All of it's a lie. Mm -hmm. All of it's a lie because men, no matter what their state of love or care, always, always desire another woman and always look at other women. Desire and looking at other women, that is not a flaw. That is a biological inherent trait of men. It cannot be overcome, but it does not mean that the man is going to necessarily have sex with her or have an affair. That's his actions. That's a dysregulated man if he decides to act on that. Mm -hmm. But if the woman acts on it, the man acts on it, of course, he's castigated as a, as a, a dishonorable man, rightly so. But if the woman acts on it and acts as a harpy and attacks him and goes after his masculinity, she's not derided. In fact, she's supported. You go, girl. All of her, all of her girlfriends, she posted on Twitter, can you believe what my boyfriend did? He looked up at this waitress and he smiled at her and she's really hot. And all of her girlfriends say, damn him, he should never look at another woman. You were right to get up and scream at him and cut his balls off and walk back to the car and cry and make him apologize and buy you some flowers. You go, girl power. Mm -hmm. well, that's emotional dysregulation. And that's a small example, a small incident. It happens every day all across the country in different ways with a lot of women. And it's accepted, it's tolerated, it's even considered to be virtuous. And it's destructive. It's absolutely destructive. I don't think that emotional dysregulation 
is rarely ever now criticized in women. Mm -hmm. It's always criticized in men. I can't believe you got angry and punched that guy in the face. Well, I was angry. Oh, 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 you're angry. That's fine. Go hit him. Nobody says that. They always say, you don't have a right to do that. Mm -hmm. But if a woman loses it and acts in an equally destructive way, maybe not punching somebody, but in a destructive way relationally, she's not criticized. She's validated. Because why? Because she has strong feelings. And women's feelings need to be respected. A woman's feelings are always right. No, they're not. <laughs> feelings are not right or wrong. Feelings just exist. What's right or wrong is what you say and do. And those are often not right. And we can no longer criticize emotional dysregulation in its expression with women because it's considered verboten. That's what I mean by emotional dysregulation. And that's what I have a problem with. Mm -hmm. Well put. There's a two-pronged question here. You you are a psychiatrist, correct? Which means you can prescribe medication, I believe. Is correct. that correct? Okay. So that's always, especially in the culture now, that's a touchy subject. So it's antidepressants, anti-anxiety. People say, well, there's too many of those floating around. That's causing harm. Sometimes people say, well, no, some people do need them. Um, so I want your medical opinion on that. And then plus that we can tie that into, how do we regulate emotions in a person that are dysregulated? Well, it's a very contentious issue because you're raising a fair point but it's one that's often not well addressed. You know, Tucker Carlson talked about this a few months ago. Right. The SSRI crisis. Why are all these kids on Prozac? Isn't it just shocking that 70% of the children that commit suicide or kill other children, but they're on antidepressants? The antidepressants must be causing this. Well, this is really a false logical argument. Mm -hmm. The reason why so many of these kids that are committing crimes or hurting themselves, hurting other people are on antidepressants it's because they're emotionally dysregulated. Just like by the definition of my previous word, they're taking actions and saying things, doing things that are destructive or harmful. And they're sick. They're emotionally ill. They, they have an emotional illness. It's not the drug that's causing that illness or causing those actions. Those are pre-existing. The drug is ostensibly there to help regulate those feelings. Now, sometimes the drug doesn't work. That doesn't mean the drug is a problem. It just means that it's ineffective. Sometimes you'll take an antibiotic and you'll need to go back to the doctor because uh, the bug is still growing. It means that the antibiotic wasn't effective. Maybe that bacterium was antibiotic resistant. We have a lot of multi-antibiotic resistant infections now that require several different drugs at one time. Does that mean that the antibiotic is bad or it's harmful? No, it just means that the bug is too strong for it. So I, I really do not agree with the contention that in large, to a large degree, that drugs are a problem, meaning prescribed drugs, by psychiatrists are a problem with children. I'm sure that in some sectors, especially primary care, there are some medications that are overprescribed, just like antibiotics are overprescribed. Uh, when you get a, a viral infection, often doctors will prescribe an antibiotic, which is inappropriate. Uh, they are, should be justifiably criticized for that. If a child is uh, is hyperactive because he's not being attended to properly at home and he's given a stimulant like Adderall because he's hyper, but he doesn't really have ADHD, he just has a problem with parenting, that's not an appropriate use of, of Adderall. Mm -hmm. That does happen. I, I'm not saying that it never happens, but in my world, what I see is not actually an overprescribing of medications for emotional illness for children. If anything, they're, they're underdiagnosed and undertreated in general. And that undertreatment is an undertreatment of therapy. It's an undertreatment often, not always, but often of medication. Children's problems are not being adequately addressed. You know, the same people that are going off on um, overprescribing of medications for children are the same people that want to put masks on children often. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a hypocrisy or at least an inconsistency in a lot of these arguments. So are drugs overprescribed? In some cases, yes. Uh, to a large degree, no. Are drugs causing uh, a mental health crisis in this country? Absolutely not. If we had two-parent households, no mass and homeschooling, I bet mental illness in children would decline by 80%. So mm. I think we should refocus our attention elsewhere rather than on uh, medications, uh, inappropriate use of medications. That's my position. Now, your second question mm -hmm. 
remind me what it was because I always lose my train of thought because I go no, off on tangents. It's uh, that was a wonderful tangent, and that's it's funny you say Tucker Carlson. That's specifically one of the things I was I had in mind when I asked you that question because I watch him on a regular basis, and I thought, as do I. Yeah, I, that was an interesting segment he had. So if there is a female or male with with dysregulated emotions mm. and and I've heard him say nervous systems dysregulated and things like that. How does that get regulated? Well, it really depends a lot on what the cause is. I mean, I'm a big proponent of going to the, the source if you can and addressing that rather than just treating symptoms. You know, if you have um, mold on a wall, you don't paint over it. Mm -hmm. You got to root the mold out. And that might mean stripping the, the walls down to the studs. And that's a big deal. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't have the time. They don't have the money. I get it. You know, but if there's a paint, if there's a, a an ink mark on the wall, uh, you can use touch up paint and it, it'll be fine. You don't need to go strip the walls down. Why would you do that? So it's the same thing with emotional dysregulation. What is actually the cause? What is the problem? Now, if the cause happens to be you've got a a drunk, abusive mother at home and there's no dad in the picture, you could give all the medication you want. It's not going to fix the emotional dysregulation. This boy is probably going to continue to be sick, maybe act out start harming other children, maybe harming himself. Terrible approach. But if the home life is great, if the parents are good and the kid's being homeschooled, he's being given proper uh, diet and, and nutrition, and uh, he has a good social circle, but he just, he's, he's quite sad. Uh, and, and it's not really clear why. You could start with therapy, depending on the age of the child. You could also start with an antidepressant medication, see if that doesn't help lift him out of the, the, the malaise that he's in while then using uh, a more longitudinal approach to address or assess for more subtle long-term problems that aren't immediately apparent in the assessment. I believe that particularly with young people, and when I say young people, I'm not just talking about kids. I'm, I'm talking about emotional dysregulation of the young adult population, like I wrote about in my recent Substack, the, kid, the undateable American woman. When emotional dysregulation is not due to a mental illness necessarily, but it's due to more of a problem with containment, emotional containment coming from bad values and media and politicians and education that all are teaching the wrong, giving the wrong message, teaching the wrong values to the child. And that could be male or female. It's often girls though. Then I think you need to actually re-educate that person. And that means you need to switch depending on the age of the person uh, to a different educational program. If you're in college and you're going to almost any college in the United States and you have emotional dysregulation, you should probably get out of college. Mm -hmm. The college is probably making it worse. Mm -hmm. If the woman feels that she's uh, being oppressed and she's angry and she's marching and screaming and she's depressed and crying at night because she believes that um, all men are rapists because that's what she's being told on campus. Well, that emotional dysregulation is coming from her environment. She needs a new environment. If a child is coming home from school every day uh, uh, crying and scared and peeing and wetting the bed because he says, Mommy, Daddy, um, the world is going to end. You know, uh, Miss Jones says that if we don't start recycling now, that in seven years, we're not going to have a planet left to live on. Well, you're not going to fix that boy's emotional dysregulation unless you take him out of school because it's the teacher. It's Mrs. Jones that's causing the problem. If you have a teenage girl who is um, saying to her parents that she's thinking about hanging herself because she's being told by everyone on social media, her so-called friends and also the, the videos that she watches, that she's fat and ugly and she wants to die. Well, the way to fix that is to take away the phone, shut off the social media, get her to read books, have her go and participate in competitive sports, have her uh, start learning music. Do something that is restoring of her ego rather than um, attacking of her ego. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-pronged question, even though it's a simple one. How do you fix emotional dysregulation? Well, the first thing is to actually address the underlying cause and then to try to rewire that, that brain so that it can see things from a more truthful position and also strengthen the resilience to self-contain and self-regulate those emotions, which has probably just been ignored. And in fact, perhaps, especially with, with young women, they've even been encouraged to ignore their own 
self-regulation mechanisms because to be dysregulated is to be, is to be virtuous. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a teaching problem. In other words, at the core, a lot of this is a values issue. It's bad parents, bad teachers, bad media. And if you fix one, two, or three of those problems, you're very likely to get the emotional dysregulation back in check, barring, very important asterisk, barring a true organic mental illness, which needs to be addressed clinically. Yes, to speak to that last point you made, there's a wonderful sentence you put in here, and I wanted to ask you about it. They have trained women to live in a fantasy world of us versus them, where the me is more important than the we, where one's feelings dictate truth and goodness and even virtue itself. I mean, I think when people hear that, you could immediately think of the last few years. Uh, Could you break that down a little bit? Well, the us versus them, the in versus out, me versus we, is 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 really a a more wordy description of something that I I focus on uh, as the title of one of the chapters in my my recent book, Freedom from Fear, which is <clears throat> excuse me, which is narcissism. We have been uh, advancing a narcissistic culture now for quite a long time. I would say it started back in the in the sixties, really, but it's just gone into into hyperdrive in the last few years, because all the breaks on narcissism have been completely removed. Narcissism is now extolled as a virtue. Mm. Me, 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 me is now a good thing. It makes Mm. you a better person. When you are giving to others, when you are self-sacrificing, you are now considered to be an idiot, a loser, a fool. When you don't include other people who are different from you in your life, you're no longer considered to be um, somebody who is trying to separate himself from the community good. You are considered to be fighting the good fight, uh, putting men into the category of bad, putting conservatives into the category of immoral, putting all women into the category of virtuous. Believe all women. Mm-hmm. I mean, if that isn't us versus them, I don't know what is. Believe all women? Are you kidding me? What, what, what quality in being female makes you inherently believable? Now, I'm not saying women are liars. Don't get me wrong. But there's nothing inherently truthful about being female, just like there's nothing inherently untruthful about being male. Male is male. Female is female. As I said, they're amoral. They're, they're neutral. But now we're being told that just because you're female, everything you say is truthful, that's that's idiocy. That's just core stupidity. And it's destructive because it now creates this false bifurcation, men versus women, as opposed to, as Dennis Prager often says on his male-female hour, I'm not a man fan. I'm not a woman fan. I am a, a good people fan. I am a fan of male or female expressing good virtues. There are a lot of crappy women and there are a lot of crappy men. There are a lot of good women and a lot of good men. Let's stop dividing people along arbitrary lines. I mean, wasn't the apartheid state uh, called out because there was this division that was formed between black and white and we considered that to be indefensible? Why are we doing that here? Why are we creating a male-female apartheid state in the United States? It doesn't make any sense. It's no different. So, I think we have a huge problem here, this sort of tribalism that's that's built up now between men and women. And and there's other subgroups besides men and women. I mean, you know, we've got, you know, gay and trans, you know, that's also a breakout group. Uh, we've got um interestingly now, you know, the gay and lesbian community is now allied against, to a large degree, yeah. the trans community. And and understandably so, because they're being attacked by the trans community. Um I think that this 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 false breakout of in-group and out-group, which I believe is led by narcissism. It's led by this extolling of the so-called virtue of me. Uh, it's led by this and reinforced by it, is, is actually creating false divisions in our society. And I think it's intentional. Divide and conquer, I think, is real. Because the more divisions we can, we can achieve, the more that men can fight with women, as opposed to fighting against bad people together, the more that men can fight against women, the more distracted we are from the thief that's coming in and stealing everything that's precious to us. Yeah. And the thief is up there. The thief is, is on high. The thief is the powerful. It's the media, it's the corporations. It's the, it's the politicians that are corrupt. And they don't want us to look at what they're doing. 
Just look at the war in Ukraine. Yes. That came up as soon as the so-called pandemic so-called ended. Right. Immediately. And the oil crisis. Did you notice last year, well, earlier this year, that from one day to the next, all of the memes for the, like, the, not the memes, but the, uh, the profile photos on Facebook and Instagram and all the social media, they all went from mask faces to show I'm in the in group. It's, 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 I'm important because I have a mask on my face and you who don't have the mask in your profile photo, you're on the out group. You're a bad person. Shame on you. All of that shifted from mass face to lapel pin Ukraine flag. Yes. Like literally overnight. And I thought, this is really weird. And those people with the lapel pins, they don't even know where Ukraine is on a map. Right. They have no clue. But you know what? I support what they're supporting, I guess. Uh, what is the latest thing? I support it. That's mm -hmm. what it was. And this, again, this created another in-group and out-group. Are you not for the war in Ukraine? Well, I don't know. I have some questions about it. Oh, so you're a stooge of Putin. <laughs> right. There was a clip, uh, a Seinfeld clip that I saw recently from yes. 20 years ago. Yeah, the AIDS Kramer. ribbon. Yes, you yes. saw it too. Yes. Beautiful clip. That exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about. Talk yes. about narcissism, egotism, in-group, out-group. For those who haven't seen it or haven't, don't remember it, who aren't a Seinfeld fanatic, Kramer goes to a booth to pay his fees for the AIDS walk. And he uh, thanks them and they thank him and he's about to turn to go join the walk. And the woman says, oh, don't forget your pin, your AIDS ribbon. And he says, oh, no, that's okay. I'm not wearing the ribbon. And she looks up and she says, excuse me, you are going to wear the ribbon. He said, no, I'm not. You must wear the ribbon. And he says, that's why I'm not wearing the ribbon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yes. you must wear the ribbon. Right. And as he gets in the walk, everyone around him starts circling. And they start turning on him and they're saying, why, why aren't you wearing the women? Aren't you against AIDS? Yeah, I'm in the walk. Of course I'm against AIDS. I'm walking, aren't I? But you're not wearing the ribbon. And this goes on and on and on until finally they, they actually beat him up because he's not wearing the ribbon. It doesn't matter that he shares their belief and values to fight AIDS. That didn't matter. It doesn't matter that he's a good person. What matters is that he has no ribbon on his vest. And that's where we come to with the mask, with the Ukraine flag, with the I'm a man, I'm bad, I'm a woman, I'm good. All of this um, flattening of complex, true virtue into a slogan, into yes. a label, into a symbol, which is a way to create an us versus them. Just like in 1984 by George Orwell, there was the, the, the us, us, the people, and then the them, the them was Oceania, it was the enemy. It wasn't the people that were locking us up, executing um, our fathers and mothers, uh, censoring our language, uh, taking our belongings, uh, interrogating and torturing us in, in, in chambers underground. No, that's not the them. They're still with us, even though they're killing us. The them is those people out there in Oceania. It's, it's them. We don't know who they are, but we know the government tells us that's our enemy. I think this, and this has been a, a this has been true for, for forever. In the 20th century, it was the same thing with the communists in the Soviet Union. You know, the communists took over and they said it's the West that's the enemy. And meanwhile, they're slaughtering their own people. And the people still stand up and support communism because the enemy is really out there in the West. Mm -hmm. It's only when the people woke up and realized the enemy is within, it's not without, yes. that they were able to rise up and, and, and overthrow the, 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 the worst of the government. Uh, there's still problems in China, obviously, but same thing, Soviet Union people rose up and threw off the dictators. Uh, it's happening now in Iran. Thank mm -hmm. God. Thank mm -hmm. God. So we need to do the same thing here. It's just not as stark. It's not as obvious as it, as it was in the 20th century. It's more insidious. It's through media, it's through political campaigns. It's through the stupid war of the sexes. All of this, all of this is literally been generated and created to, to distract ourselves from the real conflict. And it's not a conflict of men and women. That's not the conflict. The conflict is between the good and the bad. I think the war right now is really, and it always has been, Buck. Mm -hmm. It's been between good and evil. Yes. And they don't want us to fight evil. The evil people, they want us to do anything except fight evils. They want us to fight each other. If you love coffee or someone in your life loves coffee, here is the thing to do. I've got an idea for you, as does my friend Stephen Fox over at Fox & Sons Coffee. Fans of Counterflow use code BUCK25, B-U-C-K-2-5, for 25% off of your order of $25 or more now through the end of this year. Order by December 19th for delivery before Christmas. It's my favorite coffee. 
It's a wonderful business, really. This guy is so supportive of this show, Counterflow. So give him some business. He's got a wonderful family. Give this small business some money and you get some delicious coffee. And it's really cool. People are going to love it if you just order before December 19th. Give the gift of coffee. Wake people up, damn it. <laughs> Buck 25 for 25% off of your order. Order at foxandsons.com. That's F-O-X-N-S-O-N-S dot com. Thank you, guys. Let's get back to the show. It's, it's so much of what you're describing. It's our fallen human nature. And we fall into these snares and these traps of that lead to these undateable women, these apathetic, well, pathetic, uh, soft beta men that just sit at home and, and and so much of that was catered to. You know, when tyranny comes our way, it will be using our love for comfort and self uh, as as the way to get things done. As we saw over 2020, 2021, watch Netflix and chill, this kind of thing. Order food, fast food to get dropped off at your door. And it made so many quote unquote men wow, this is actually kind of nice. I guess I don't have to put clothes on or, you know, go work out or anything that that would be considered, you know, to make you a, a nice looking macho, uh, you know, marryable man. They All of that goes by the wayside. And then ironically, we get to this time of the year and you hear these type of people saying, I'm just depressed. It's Christmas. It's the holidays. And it's like, Everything, Dr. McDonald, that you talk about in your Substack, it's like, yes, because you're falling into these traps and now you're depressed in December. So in closing, um, we got a few more minutes. Can you talk about this phenomenon and, 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 and how this manifests itself? I just spoke for a, a full hour on Jeremy Nell's podcast. He's a podcaster out of uh, South Africa, Germ Warfare. Interestingly, because on the, the case for Christmas was the subject. And uh, we had a lot of trouble with our audio uh, and I thought it was due to the hardware in my computer, but I tur turned out later because I was on Jesse Kelly a few hours later and I had perfect audio. The problem was actually that uh, he was running a generator because they have intermittent uh, electrical shutdowns because the government doesn't want them to have electricity anymore. Uh, Biden has paid about, I think, $8 billion to the government of South Africa. If the president promises to shut down all the remaining coal-powered coal electrical generating plants. And they don't have anything but one plant that's nuclear because they want to convert to wind and solar, which of course doesn't work because the wind farms are, they, they don't they don't spin in South Africa. There's no wind. So it was a problem of electricity and that was what was corrupting the feed. What we talked about uh, was the, the, the case for Christmas. I, I talked about that and I said, look, this time of year is very emotionally turbulent. People are very depressed. They feel things very strongly because in, in, a, in a kind of somewhat uh, complex or, or paradoxical fashion, the, the mystery of Christmas runs head in to the reality and the truth of our lives all at once in the last couple of weeks of the year, which is also an important time because it's the end of the year. I mean, New Year follows that. We have a new fresh start. So there's this religious rebirth death rebirth, and also a kind of calendaric rebirth, you know, this symbolic rebirth of starting a new year. And because Christmas comes every year, and we as children, at least until recently with children, grew up with presents and trees and lights and Santa Claus, there's a, a, a lineage of memory, of, of emotional memory from very, very early on of what Christmas means. And so as you get older, as you become an adult and, and life happens, and things work out or don't work out for you, you, you have an attachment to Christmas as an experience, as, as a mystery. And, and you start to feel like, well, maybe, maybe the reality of my life isn't matching the mystery of what it was when I was a child. And so it creates a lot of depression, a lot of regret, a lot of sadness, a lot of loneliness. Even people who have great lives will feel these feelings because maybe they've lost a parent. And they remember what it was like when they were with their parents, mm -hmm. uh, opening up presents. And now their parents are gone. So there's sadness connected with Christmas. That's not pathologic. It's normal. It's a very feeling laden, good feelings and, and also negative, sad feelings as well. So Christmas is a very complex emotional experience for, for everyone, not just for religious people, 
even for atheists, because Christmas is not just a religious holiday. Christmas is a national holiday. It's a federal holiday. That's why everything is closed on the 25th. Not because everybody is required to worship Jesus. It's because we consider this to be a unifying themed experience for Americans of every faith. So this is a really, really important holiday for many reasons, for civic reasons, for religious reasons, and also for personal psychological reasons. I believe that the attack on Christmas is not just because it's a religious holiday and religion has been under attack now, at least Christianity has been, Judaism have been under attack now for, for three or four, five, 10 years, really a lot in the last few years. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think the reason for that is that organized Christianity, especially non-Catholic, but, but more of the evangelical Christian community is the only remaining organized strong bulwark against despotism in this country. There is no other single group that has any power except organized Christians. That's it. There's no civic groups left. Uh, you have a few, you know, individual groups here and there, but on a national level, it's Christians that are fighting against despotism because they mm-hmm. represent individuality. They represent families. They represent thinking for yourself. They represent masculinity and femininity because Christians are largely still supportive of traditional femininity and masculinity. Mm-hmm. They, they live in truth, not in lies. Uh, they're not generally beholden to media and corporations uh, like people in urban secular environments are a lot of reasons, but I think there's more to the attack on Christmas than just the attack on Christians, because the attack on Christmas is also an attack on on saying Merry Christmas to somebody in a store. It's now happy holidays, right? It's, it's not, it's not Merry Christmas. Uh, there's an attack on putting up Christmas lights, which are not inherently religious. A lot of Jews enjoy Christmas lights and they're not Christians. Why is there attack on, on Christmas lights? And the, the rationale for it is, is now as a, as a little girl said to her father recently, uh, cause her father told me, uh, that her, his daughter didn't want to have Christmas lights out. You know, what child doesn't want Christmas lights out? Well, daddy, uh, you're ruining the environment oh, by putting God. out Christmas lights because of the electricity, right? That's the rationale. And what's the rationale for not saying Merry Christmas? Well, you're excluding people. Oh, really? That's interesting because it's a federal holiday. When you say happy fork, when you say a happy Thanksgiving, are you excluding people now? They'll say that you are. You're, you're excluding those who hate the, hate the United States. Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> when I say happy fork, you know what? Suck it up. Live with it. You're in America. You're excluding the native and the Indians, the native Americans. Uh, when you say happy Thanksgiving, really? Are, are, are they upset with Thanksgiving? I don't think so. Uh, at least it's, it's mostly rich white liberals in Malibu that are upset with Thanksgiving yes. and they're not Indians, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, that's true with other holidays as well. But there's something specific about Christmas. Uh, no Merry Christmas, because it's exclu- It's excluding. Even though I think it's one of the most inclusive holidays that we have. Uh, no lights, well, because of the environment. Um, no, well, gift giving. We're still supportive of gift giving, because that helps corporations and Amazon like to buy and sell. Yeah, yeah, consumerism is still supported. That's still supported. Yeah. Um, getting together with family. Uh, remember the last three years? Mm-hmm. You shouldn't stay at home with your family and get together, uh, you should uh, do Zoom Christmas. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't go out and meet in restaurants either because that's very dangerous. You're spreading disease. You should have grandma sit outside the window and you should uh, pass sterilized food through a trap door so that she can eat and you can wave at her. Literally, this is what we were being told. I'm not exaggerating. So there's an attack on getting together all under the guise of health. You see how there's always a rationale for not doing something that promotes good that promotes mm-hmm. goodwill, warmth, connection, um, uh, a, a sense of purpose, of religious affiliation, whatever it is. So I think that the attack and the war on Christmas comes down to this. I think it's based on a universal, meaning from one party, one group of people in the country, and I'm just for lack of a better word right now, I'll just call them the left, but it includes corporatists as well. But I'm going to call it the left. I'm not saying just Democrats. Right. There's a lot of liberal Democrats that don't support this nonsense. I'm going to call it the left, meaning the destructive force that wants to steamroll everything that's good in our traditions, our history, our society, religion, all of that. The left is just, it's, it's, it's evil. It's a dark force. It's like, it's like, um, Sauron and the Lord of, uh, Lord of the Rings. That's what I mean by the left. That group wants to destroy joy and Christmas more than any other holiday specifically connotates joy for religious believers and for atheists alike. Christmas is joy. The fourth is patriotism. 
little different. Thanksgiving, communion. But Christmas is joy. It's all about joy. And I don't mean happiness. I mean joy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. There's a difference between pleasure and joy. There's a difference between hedonism and joy. Mm-hmm. Joy has a, almost a, an elevating quality. It's angelic. It's an aspirational state that we get through con- participating in a religious ex- exercise or meeting with our family or giving and receiving with sincerity or putting out lights and building a tree and decorating it. That brings joy. And the left doesn't like joy. Joy is dangerous because joy disavows everything that they push. It disavows envy. You can't be joyous and envious. It disavows anxiety, disavows fear. If you're joyous, you're not fearful. Certainly, if you're fearful, it's not inhibiting your actions. It disavows competitiveness and sniping and slander and libel. It disavows us versus them because when you're joyous, you want everyone to join in your joy. You don't want to, you don't want to parcel out your joy. You don't want to, um, limit your joy in cutting off little snubbins to other people. You want the joy to expand. You want it to multiply. That's what joy is. Joy is infectious. Joy is like light. It's, it's like, um, the sterilizing effect of the sun and the left wants only darkness. Mm -hmm. The left wants the sun to be blotted out. This is why I think the attack on Christmas is so profound and universal. I don't think it's just anti-religious. It is, but it's more than that. It's anti-joy. And the left is anti-joy. Anything that spreads joy, they want to to undermine. And so I think that if you want to make the case for Christmas, it's actually not that hard. I don't even have to use religion as a as a as a an argument. I don't care if you're religious or not. You should celebrate Christmas, maybe not by celebrating the birth of Jesus. If you don't want to, fine, whatever. But you should celebrate the spirit of Christmas, whoever you are, whether you are old or young, black or white, gay or straight, religious or atheist or Jewish, you should celebrate the, the, the Christmas spirit because it brings joy and it brings goodness. And we need more of that in our country. And that will help to push back against the darkness and the left. That is why uh, the case for Christmas can and should, and I say must be made. Well put. Parting words for anyone. Well, I'll get you to plug uh, the books, your Substack, and podcasts. Uh, any parting words for people listening that do feel down or, or confused or apathetic? Yeah, this is a tough time. I get it. A lot of people, understandably, for the reasons I mentioned just now, um, are not feeling a lot of joy. I understand that. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person because you don't feel joyous. What I suggest to people, as I often do, I think even more so now at this time of year, is if you're feeling down, if you're feeling isolated, you're feeling alone, the best thing for you to do is to get involved. Meaning, if you can, attract and surround yourself with like-minded people wherever possible, especially right now. And if you can't do that, if you don't have physically nearby people, then you need to join other people who are also doing good and spreading joy. And that can, especially in this time of year, often mean joining a group that is giving. Go to a soup kitchen, go to a shelter. Find there's always easy, easy, easy right now this time of year. There's tons of people and groups that just prop up like, like the, uh, uh, the spirit store in Halloween. They pop up all around the country for two weeks to sell costumes. Well, there's pop up charities all over the country. That fortunately has not yet been shut down. Thank goodness. Maybe it will next year. <laughs> Join those groups and I guarantee you that will bring you joy because it will bring you a sense of meaning and purpose. And if there's one thing that human beings need more than anything is a sense of meaning and purpose. And of course, that's being attacked by the left, right, and left as well. They're saying you don't need meaning and purpose. You just need feelings. You need anger. Mm -hmm. You need to attack other people. That's not going to bring you joy. It's not going to bring you happiness. It's not going to allow you to achieve your your potential as a human. So surround yourself with other people that are like-minded. Barring that, go and join a group that, that, that that is giving to others. And I, I guarantee you, you will immediately begin to feel better. And, and it's not because you're, you know, like whiskey makes you feel better. It's not a drug induced feel better. It's because you're actually doing something that's purposeful, meaningful, and good. That is what I recommend to people who are struggling right now with the holidays and meaning specifically with Christmas. I also would encourage people who are suffering and are needing to connect with others to spend some time with honest reflection or in honest reflection and 
I, I, I believe that the book that I recently wrote, Freedom from Fear, can help achieve that because it's broken down into a 12-step program to overcoming fear. And it can also be overcoming despondency as well. If you can sit and follow the steps that I outline in that book, and they're, they're not easy. They require some real internal work and looking in and overcoming some of the psychological blocks that I've been talking about this past hour. I do believe that you can achieve a greater sense and experience of fulfillment, of happiness, of joy, and also becoming a better person and being a good person. I have a sub stack that I write that I publish every Thursday. You quoted from the most recent one that came out today on why American women are undateable called Dissident MD. And Dissident MD can be found, as well as my books, as well as links to everything except my podcast, really, on my literary website, which is also called Dissident MD. And on that website, Dissident MD, you can see my posts on Facebook, on Twitter, where I post uh, links to all of my interviews. If you want to watch what I'm talking about on video or listen to it on audio, all of it's there. My books are there. Links to my Substack are there. Everything can be found about me on Dissident MD. The only thing that you can't get there, because it's all video, uh, is my podcast. And my podcast is called Informed Dissent. And Informed Dissent is found at informeddissentmedia.com. Or you can just go to Apple Podcasts or any podcasting site and just type in Informed Dissent. It'll pop up. And Dr. Jeff Barkey and I, we interview really fascinating and important people of the day uh, about healthcare, about medicine, about politics, about social issues. We just interviewed the parents recently of the girl from Ukraine, Yulia, mm-hmm. uh, who lives in North Carolina, who's been, uh, I think it's North or South Carolina, we're getting confused, where Duke is, uh, who's been denied a kidney transplant because she doesn't want to get an mRNA injection, a so-called vaccine, and so that she's being left to die because the hospital does not want her to get a transplant without getting a shot. And she actually caught this Wuhan virus and actually has natural immunity to it now. And they're still ignoring her medical plight. So here we are supporting a war in Ukraine, giving billions of dollars to a country that is 14,000 miles away, but we won't protect the life of a Ukrainian girl who was adopted by this family. I think they have nine children. Most of them are adopted. One girl from Ukraine because she doesn't want to uh, to get an, an, an injection that actually may kill her. So we just put, published that recently uh, on our podcasting site, and that and many other interesting stories are are at Informed Descent. Geez, I guess in that battle we're finding out which uh, emblem is more important to the awful, as they call them, affluent white uh, female liberals: the, the the jab picture or the Ukrainian flag. Unfortunately, Cre- creates quite a conflict, doesn't it? Yeah. Which which emblem? Are you going to support more? Is it the Ukrainian flag or is it the the needle? Mm. It, it 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 does create a bit of an interesting paradox. I I'd like to 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 throw that question at them and ask them, put them on the spot and ask them to answer and see what they say. Mm. Doctor Mark McDonald, thank you so much for uh, this hour. It's been uh, great as always. Thank you so much, sir. Enjoyed it greatly. Thanks, Buck. Yes. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with. The great Dr. Mark McDonald, lots of good stuff in there, lots of good stuff. Share this episode around, and I think it'll be helpful to a lot of people. It's been wonderful having y'all along all year. And this, like I said, this is the last show of the year. So I get to say, I love saying this around these times. I won't see you guys until next year. I will not be putting out another show until next year. And uh, I think I've overloaded you with humor now. Happy New Year, you guys. And uh, we will see you back I believe the next show drops the day before my birthday. Check it out. I've already got the guest booked. We will see you guys next year. Have a good one. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.